Okay, let's begin with a uh, short prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for the gift of the word. We ask that we may come to a deeper understanding and that it may enlighten us in the way we live. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. Amen. Okay, now remember, we, this has been kind of a dialogue. The section we're entering uh, now, we had two verses. This is chapter two, verse three. So verse three, again, is the young woman now talking about the young man. So the early part was a man talking about the woman. Now this is the young woman. She says, as an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my love among young men. A, cu a couple things that this, this should show you that um, this was probably not written in Israel. And one of the reasons is apple trees are, were not a thing in Israel at that time. I, I don't know if you know that apples are one of the major, um, what do you call it, crops in Israel right now. But it's up in the cooler areas, not in the, 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 the desert type areas. But so the, this is an indication that it, it came from outside Israel. And there are a couple things when you deal with scripture, any reference to the apple tree is a reference to something, you know, like in Genesis, that's very appealing and gen dangerous, which is the, you know, the reference to the sin. And so, uh, so she says, so is my love among young men. In his delightful shade, I sit, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. And the idea here is that um, the shade is protection from the, the sun in the, the desert. And so she, she finds his shade delightful and his fruit is sweet to my taste, which is most probably a reference to kisses. Um, he has taken me to his cellar and his banner over me is love. And the, the reference here, uh, it's interesting, they, uh, they use the term here, cellar in, uh, I think the, er, this is a, the brand new Jerusalem translation, but I think the, the traditional one is banquet hall. And uh, his banner over me is love. In the, uh, in the, the large halls, that they had, and remember we're talking Bedouins, so a large hall, we're talking inside a tent, okay? But the large halls would have uh, like a sign as to what the room was for, because they would rotate them as to what the rooms were used for. You know, this could be a bedroom one night, and then it could be the dining room the next day, depending on the size, number of people. They just moved it around that way. So, so there would be a sign and, and the idea is the sign is love, so that the room is to be used for their relationship. She says, feed me with raisin cakes, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. And raisin cakes uh, were actually something that were used in uh, many of the pagan worships. And uh, I don't, I, I see several references to them in the scriptures. I don't know whether they were in common use among the Jews, but what they did, if you've ever had a box of raisins, you know how they get packed really tight? Well, they would make these cakes, uh, like in a form, something like a bunting cake, and they would make a ring of these and press them really hard. But then when they're in there, they would pour wine over them just a little. and while you were having raisins, they actually were fermented raisins. The whole thing would ferment. And they were called raisin cakes. And uh, they were connected with lots of celebrations. His left hand is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. And so she's referring to their you know, involvement with one another. And uh, he is embracing her at the same time holding up her head. And she turns to, there's a chorus in the group, and the chorus is called the Daughters of Jerusalem. And so she turns to the chorus now, and she says, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and wild does, 
do not arouse and do not awaken my beloved before she pleases. So now this is the man responds to what she's saying. So he's got his hand under her head, his right arm is embracing her, and then he turns to these, this choir and says not to, uh, to, uh, uh, to wake her. Now, remember, I told you that the, um, what do you call it, the, the symbolism that the rabbis got out of it was the relationship with Israel and the symbolism that historically spiritual authors in the Catholic Church see this as a relationship with God. And this idea of do not awaken my beloved before she pleases it is the idea that the relationship between God and an individual actually is on a timing thing. We're gonna see after here where she goes searching for him and cannot find him. And the thing is, you, you cannot get to God. You have to wait for God to reach you. But on the same way, God has to wait till I want to reach God. And it's, uh, it's well, it's, I think it's the same thing between two people who fall in love. That it's, it's a timing thing and it, it takes a, a certain process to develop and that sort of thing. So this thing about this, and he says, by the gazelles, and the wild does, and it's it's the both the gazelles and the wild does are um, what do you call it? Are are prey animals? Uh, the big thing uh, animal in the Middle East at the time this thing is written is called the Palestinian lion, and it no longer exists. It's been it's extinct. But remember, David had to fight lions when he was with the sheep. Samson fought lions. So they're referring to those lions. But as you can imagine, the uh, gazelles and wild does, they are the, the food of the lions. And so he says, do not waken them. This, and it's the idea that wild, do, do, wild does and the gazelles are really fast moving if they're surprised. And the whole idea is don't awaken her, let her sleep until the time is right, okay, lest, lest she flee. And she goes on, she says, the voice of my love, see how he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills, my love is like a gazelle, like a young stag, okay? And she picks up the gazelle from his is speaking of the gazelle, so she, she moves into that. And uh, in part of the, um, when, when you study marriage, I probably mentioned this before, but marriage ceremonies in cultures are always ritualized. And the marriage ceremony is a ritual of what's gone on historically. Now, in our system, our marriage, uh, ceremony is a ritualized sale and it was it used to be that the uh, the daughter was given with a dowry and the groom paid a certain thing to the father-in-law and that's why we see like and this is forbidden in Catholic marriages but it everyone wants to do it but you're not allowed to where the the father of the bride brings her down the aisle I see he's bringing her up for the sale, you know? And then who sells, oh, who gives this woman, okay? And he says, I do. And then, you know, she's handed over to the man. He goes up there and he goes back. It's the, what the church would prefer is one of two things. Uh, they would like the groom to come down the aisle with his parents and then be installed at the beginning and the bride then to follow with her parents and then to be installed and we go through the ceremony. But the other thing we try and persuade people to do, oftentimes we do con convalidations and the people have been maybe civilly married for 10 years or something like that. In fact, I have done weddings where it was the first actual Catholic marriage for both the man and the woman and there were six children involved in the ceremony 
I mean, they were everything from the best man, maid of honor, to the flower girl, were all their children. And so in that case, we encourage the bride and groom to come down the aisle together because it's already the union, okay? But anyway, the, so that's a ritualized thing. In the Mideast, the marriages are very different. In the Mideast, it's a ritualized rape because basically the way they got spouses was they would raid a neighboring tribe and steal the woman they wanted, okay? This sort of thing. And so in, in their system, the way it's done is if the bride here and uh, the groom here and uh, decide to get married, now I, I'm talking about today, they decide to get married, then they you know, make the arrangements and all this sort of thing. But one of the deals is the young man with the groomsman will go to the bride's house where she is with the bridesmaids and it's a game. The bridesmaids are supposed to be watching for the groomsmen to try and hide the bride, okay? And the groomsmen are supposed to make sure the groom gets there before they hide the bride. And so it's a thing that goes on. And you'll remember like there's the story about the bridesmaids who had the lamps without the necessary oil. At, at night, you cannot walk the streets without a light. If you do, you are by definition a thief. So you have to always have a light with you when you're out. And also, I, before street lights, everything, you can imagine that was necessary anyway. But so anyway, the, this, is, this ritual thing is going on. And what they're describing is the man who's on his way to collect the bride. And so he runs, leaping, bounding over the hills, the mountains. He's trying to get there, you know, before they hide the bride. She says, see where he stands behind our wall. He looks in at the window, peering through the opening. My love lifts his voice, and then he says to me, and then she goes on. Now they switch to a different thing. I told you there are a bunch of things going on in this. Now they're switching to her being in the harem. She's in the harem of the sultan, and the young man comes. And she says that he looks in at the window. I don't know whether you have uh, ever been to the Mideast, but one of the things, they do not like women to be seen. So the windows are usually done with several layers of lattice work, you know, and because it's darker inside, lighter outside, you, you can't see in and they can see out, okay? Now, if you ever get a chance to visit Istanbul, one of the places you want to visit is Top Kapi. Top Kapi is the last remaining real palace of a sultan. And if you go into that, one of the things you can see is the harem. And the harem is a large enclosed area where the women would live. They all had their own apartments around a central fountain and pool and stuff. It was really beautiful. But the windows were all installed there backwards so the sultan could see the women and the women could not see who was looking through the window. And that's what they're describing here, where the man comes to the window inside the sultan's house, he can see her, but she can't see him. She knows he's there, but she cannot see him. So he stands at the window peering through the opening now she says, my love lifts his voice, and he says to me. Now the voice allows us her, allows her to recognize him. Now I want you to understand this situation because it's very, very important to a, a special theology in the church that he can see her and he can speak. She cannot speak because she'll give away the fact that she knows him and we're in some kind of a danger. But because he can see, she can make signs. Now he can't make signs. She can't see him. But this thing of communicating, one of the uh, great English authors, uh, in fact, there, there are only four people in all of history who've done an entire translation of the Bible. The first was Jerome. Um, Forget who the second one was. 
The third, though, was uh, Monsignor Ronald Knox. And the fourth was uh, Toklin, who did the Jerusalem Bible. But anyway, uh, Monsignor Ronald Knox wrote a book, and the book he titled, he wrote, is called The Window in the Wall. And it's a whole book, but it's a theology of the Eucharist. They said before the Eucharist, the Eucharist is like this window through which God is looking at us, and we know he's there, but we can't see him. And you know, the whole thing of, we have to learn to communicate with God differently than we communicate with people, or we don't communicate with God. There has to be a different way. And so he uses this. So she, he says to her, come then my love, my lovely one, come. For see, the winter is past, the rains are over and gone, okay? In, uh, in that part of the world where they have rain, and I want you to know it's very rare, but there's a few months in the year when they can have rain, but it's very dangerous to move anywhere in the area while rain is going on, and it's because it's a desert area. Flash floods are all over the place. I think I told you about the Volkswagen at uh, the Dead Sea. Did I tell you that about? Uh, about maybe 11 years ago I was going and uh, the Dead Sea's down here and the area above it is what we call the Judean Desert, okay? And um, the day before we went there, there was a flash flood and uh, six people were going along the road on the edge of the uh, Dead Sea uh, in a Volkswagen van and they were swept right into the Dead Sea and all died. But the, uh, the idea is like if you're there on a bus or you're there on a tour, you'll notice that they will never turn off the radio. The radio is always on. And it's because you don't get rain at the Dead Sea. You get rain up in the high Judean desert. And so you have a cloudless day, sun as hot as Hades, and, and then suddenly, water comes pouring down these things off the high desert in your head. But that's why anyone who's down there who has an ounce of sense has a radio on, and they'll let you know, you know about that. And so she can't, he can't call her out to, to find him during the rainy season. But he says, now the rainy season's over, and you get the impression that they've been planning this for a while, just waiting for the rainy season to end. And so now uh, she can come. And uh, she, she uh, he, he responds to her. He says, come then, my love, my lovely one, come. For see, the winter is past, and the rains are over and gone. Flowers are appearing on the earth. The season of songs has come, okay? So first of all, the reference to flowers in, um, it, it, and it has a lot to do with where you live. The, the place I know uh, best about this is in, in Rome. In Rome, people used to put a planter on their, their uh, uh, porch. And uh, what, what they would plant in the planter was crocus. And when the crocus ble bloomed, it was officially you were invited to the, uh, uh, the spring rites that took place in the temple of Aphrodite. And you were invited to that, you know, or Diana in Rome. And you were invited to that. And so the, um, the because the invitation came from the God, okay? It was important to live on the sunny side of the street, actually. And so, so you had this, but so flowers in all their cultures the bloom of a particular flower symbolizes the beginning of summer, the beginning of spring, and everything. And so she refers to that, but she doesn't refer to which, uh, which of the flowers they're talking about. And the season of songs has come. I think you know that uh, in, in areas where they don't have, uh, don't have heaters and stuff like that, the end of winter is a very, very important thing. In fact, in, in Israel, you know, we're all very 
acclimated, okay? In Israel, people have an easy time dealing with heat. They are used to heat, There's, so they, they just bite the bullet, but not cold weather. Cold weather, I was in Jerusalem once when it snowed, and when it snowed, the city stopped for four days. I think they had a quarter inch of snow, okay? <laughs> but for four days, nothing moved in the city, period, you know? Just, but so anyway, now the, the winter is gone, and, uh, and this is a time for singing in life. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, okay? And, and the turtle dove is what you and I know as the morning dove, the, the thing goes. It says, the fig tree is putting forth its figs, and the blossoming vines give out their fragrance. Come then, my beloved, my lovely one, come. And this idea of the fig tree, of course, we know that's a sign of the season, but more important, the blooming vines. And basically, in, if you were to go into Greek or Roman society, their sexual rights always took place outdoors, and their sexual rights always took place in gardens. And uh, like, for instance, a, a good example, if I were to use a, a California example, if you were to go through uh, the, the valley when the almond trees and stuff are blooming, well, you, can, you have the fragrance, you have the beauty and all that, and that's what they would do when these trees were blooming in, uh, in different societies at, at that time. That was, that was the sign of the, the celebration. So uh, he calls her to come. He says, my dove, Hiding in the clefts of the rock, in the co coverts of the cliff, show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Okay, so the, the compliment. But you notice the voice thing, she cannot speak at this point. He wants to hear her voice, but of course she cannot speak. And now that group called the uh, Daughters of Jerusalem. This is a chorus that they come in with. And they say, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in fruit. Um, foxes are very common in the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the grape areas, grape arbors. They have, foxes are very common, and it's very good to have the foxes because they eat rodents, and so they're, they're very good in there. What happens is when the foxes have kits, little baby foxes, they are the most dangerous thing in the world. And one of the reasons is the kits aren't out hunting for food, they're just playing. So they will dig up vines and stuff like this. So the, the little foxes, the kits, are really dangerous. So he says, catch the foxes for us. They'll hide the little ones that ruin the vineyards. And so that he wants to preserve the vineyard for them to go there. And she responds, my love is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Okay, so my love is mine and I am his. This, this union between the two of them is like, um, you know, the, uh, oftentimes married people use the phrase at the time of the wedding that, um, you know, I, I was destined for you, you were destined for me, or that sort of thing. This is kind of what's going on here. You know, this idea, we are destined. So we technically belong to one another, although we met one another at this point and this sort of thing. So... And then she says, uh, he pastures his flock among the lilies, which means she knows the area where he pastures his flock. She knows where he's going to be. She says, before the day breeze rises, before the shadows flee, return. My love be like a gazelle, like a young stag on the mountains of Bethur. Bethur is a, an area actually uh, outside Israel. It's an area in the Persian area. And so 
he, he, she sang that uh, before, before dawn, before uh, the, the day breeze comes, she says, uh, come like a young stag, in other words, to rescue her. Now we go through a section by her where she is looking for him. She says, on my bed at night, I sought him who my soul loves. So basically, she's saying that she's in bed and she's dreaming about him. Okay, I sought him, my heart loves. I sought him, but could not find him. So I shall get up and go around the city. In the streets, in the squares, I shall seek him whom my heart loves. I sought him, but could not find him. Now remember, her being in the sultan's thing, he couldn't reach her. But now she in the city can't find him. And she told him, you know, to come in before it gets light and that sort of thing. She can't find him either. And the, again, the whole thing is how does this relationship get worked out? And, and, and think of it in, in the mind of, of Israel. A lot of times when they wanted, needed, and expected the intervention of God, it didn't occur. And then at times it would occur like that, like during the Exodus or something. And the, the same thing with regards to the church. You know, there are times it was very important that God should act on behalf of the church, and it didn't. And there are times when God works with great power in the church almost immediately. And something to know about, I've, I've shared this with other people, so I think I've probably shared it here before. I have learned over a period of my time that if I could actually define the way God deals with me. The way God deals with me is I, you know, I pray and I have petitions, that sort of stuff. I think they just pile up on his desk, some kind of a folder. <laughs> but periodically, he will pick up my folder. And when he picks up my folder, he goes through everything. It's gone and it's empty there. But it doesn't happen when I'm asking. But there, there comes a time, and it comes periodically almost, you know, I could name it, but when it comes, everything is resolved, puts it back in the thing. I guess he works on other people at other times, you know? I don't know what he's doing, but that, that's the way it, it, it strikes me. So she says, um, she says, I came upon the watchmen, those who go round the city, have you seen him who my soul loves? They're basically policemen, and the watchmen go around the inside of the city. There's two kinds of watchmen. Remember, their city has a, a wall. There's watchmen on the wall who are watching for outside problems, and watchmen in the city who are watching for anyone going around without a light, basically. You know, so they're going around that way. So they asked him, have, they asked them, have you seen him whom my heart loves. I had barely passed them when I found him whom my heart loves. I caught him and would not let him go, not till he, I brought him to my mother's house, to the room where she conceived me. Okay, so now, you know, she can't get the response from other of these people, and then just suddenly he shows up. And when he shows up, she grabs him. And she brought him to her mother's house. Again, I think you know that in the, uh, her mother's house is basically where her father is too. And that's, you know, that's part of the whole wedding thing. So uh, to, get, to get them. And to the very room where she conceived me. And now he turns and he's speaking again to this chorus. He says, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and wild does, do not arouse, do not awaken my beloved before she pleases. Now remember, that's a repeat. That's like a chorus. So he says, don't, don't waken her. Don't, you know, there's her before uh, this is to go on. Okay? Now, they, they pick up an image in this one of King Solomon. But the, 
the sultan who's kidnapped the girl and everything would be more likely the King Solomon figure. But now they're using the King Solomon figure almost as being the, the lover, the young man. So here it goes. And uh, it's the guy speaking again. He says, what is this coming up from the desert like columns of smoke with burning myrrh and incense from all the spices of the merchants? Now, what they're talking about here is that I, I told you there's this formal thing where the groom goes and check. Well, this takes place in a very elaborate way with regards to kings and queens or sultans and this sort of thing. And the, the man arrives, you know, on horseback or something like that, and there's all the spices burning and the, the incense and everything. So that's, they, this has been moved up a whole notch in the, the Solomon thing. And he goes on, he says, see, it is Solomon's polyking. Around it are 60 champions from the champions of Israel, all of them skilled swordsmen, expert in war. Each has his sword at his side against night attacks. So it's Solomon, Solomon coming. And the young man is really talking about himself as approaching the, the woman and ar around him are the 60 champions, and they would be like we would call a, a guard. Uh, in this case, it's probably an honor guard, but it would represent, you know, uh, protection. And all of them are skilled swordsmen. This isn't just anyone. And each has his sword at his side against night attacks. And what, what they're describing is that he's coming to her, but remember, she couldn't reach him when she tried to reach him. And this idea, as he's coming towards her, he is still protected. He cannot be gotten to. And so this, this protection is something that, that, that protects God from the assault of people. And so that in, in this protection, um, God is protected from the evil and from the difficulties in the world. If, if uh, I brought this into Catholic terms, we see this as a, a wisdom type thing. And I'll, I'll tell you how this works. That when I turn to God in prayer, I will tell God, let's say, exactly what I need. But the fact is, the wisdom of God prevents him from misunderstanding what I think I need. Okay, and I would go back to, uh, I mentioned this, I think, last Sunday's sermon at the thing. When, uh, when I was a little boy, I was born and raised in Pacific Beach, and it was the very first place outside Hawaii that surfing came. So we had surfing there. The grade school that I was in was a block and a half from the ocean, and were it not for the houses on the other side of the street, we could have seen the ocean, but you could smell it and hear it in the class all the time. Now, as surfing got more and more significant there in uh, Pacific Beach, uh, remarkably, the number of people attending classes at my grade school dropped dramatically and over a period of time. The difficulty was my parents really didn't understand the significance of surfing and required me to go to school. I, the only good grades I ever got were attendance. And I, I swear, if I had had COVID, my mother would have brought me to class on a gurney. I mean, I missed no classes. So, so I was always there. And I would see that as, you know, almost Machiavellian, the way they were dealing with it. The other curse is my mother was a registered nurse. And she knew a play when she saw one. So you couldn't fake anything, you know? So it was, but anyway, the, uh, the idea is that I saw that as a horrendous problem going on. Today, the thing I'm most thankful for about myself is my education. And I realized that, you know, that I was very against the thing that would ultimately end up being the most important for me, 
I was very much against it. And see, that's the wisdom of God, that if I turn to God and I say, please God, I want to go surfing, God would hear that, you know, surfing the first, you know, 15 years of your life, but the rest of it will matter with your education. So really what you want, you know. So that's, these are the guards that, that protect God from this thing. It helps him to understand it. So uh, King Solomon had a poliquin made of wood from Lebanon. Now, we normally think of the Lebanon cedar, this very tall cedar for which Lebanon is famous, okay? But there's another cedar that grows in Lebanon that they're talking about here. It's what we call aromatic cedar. There's a lot of cedars that grow in Lebanon. But the aromatic cedar does not grow tall and that sort of thing. So you can't use it for masks on ships, which is how Lebanon got famous was those. But so this is made of this uh, aromatic uh, cedar. And when you read the temple, uh, the description of the building of the temple, they'll describe as cedar coming from Lebanon. And they mean both kinds. What they did was use the uh, big cedars from Lebanon as the uh, de beams in the temple and everything. But the entire inside of the temple was paneled with aromatic cedar. And it, so it had this wonderful scent to it. He made the uprights of silver, the canopy of gold, the seat of purple, the center inlaid with ebony. And uh, one of the uh, things in Egypt uh, that, uh, I don't know whether it still goes on, but it's a historic uh, art form from Egypt, is that they will, they will take uh, a wooden structure and they do a, a mosaic on it. And the mosaic is done out of ebony, which is really heavy black wood, and ivory. So it's all done in black, ebony and ivory. And I think it's from that design they took it to the piano. But anyway, the they ancient, ancient things. If you ever go to um, Nazareth, there's a large church. It's dedicated to the Virgin Mary. It's a church in the Annunciation. But uh, when you go in there, there are uh, uh, large panels of the Virgin Mary dedicated from different countries, okay? For my money, the most beautiful one is from Japan. And it, if you get close to it, look at it, the entire background is pearls. And then it's set with these different precious stones and stuff. But anyway, the one from Africa is done out of ivory and ebony. It's done in black and white. It's just, it's very, very nice. And so they're describing this as being a beautiful carriage that he's coming in. And uh, he says, daughters of Zion, come and see Solomon wearing the diadem with which his mother crowned him on his wedding day, on the day of his heart's joy. First of all, <clears throat> says, come and see uh, King Solomon wearing the diadem with which his mother crowned him. I don't know if you know about how Solomon became king, but David was elderly, and while David was very elderly, a very powerful revolt broke out against David, and it was led by his son Absalom, who was actually next in line for the kingship, the eldest son. And uh, the, the, what do you call it, the, a uh, young man was defeated, and that was all over, and David was able to come back to Jerusalem, and he's an elderly man and everything. And uh, Bathsheba was one of his wives, and Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon. And she went in to David, and she said, David, you promised my son would be the next king. And uh, I guess that promise had been made, you know. But anyway, so um, although by age it would have been uh, the other guy. So uh, anyway, so David said yes. And she says, you know, forces, you're old and you're here in the palace, uh, basically elderly. And she says, um, if you don't 
appoint a king now to replace you, or you're going to be overthrown by one of your sons. And so, and she says, you promised Solomon. So David actually ceded the kingship to Solomon, which made David very unusual in the ancient world because he actually died in bed as a king. All kings ended up murdered when they got old and weak, but David actually died in bed at home. And Solomon then uh, became the next king. So in a real sense, he was crowned by his mother. And he says, crowned on his wedding day. Now, again, to go to ceremony, I love the sources of ceremonies, but if you watch the ceremony of a coronation of a king, like you'll get a chance to watch Charles, I'm sure, before too long. But if you watch the, can, the coronation ceremony, watch and listen very carefully. What it is, it's the marriage between Charles and England. That's what it will be. And you will, you will find that in most places where they have royalty. Now ours, it doesn't work that way because you know there'll be another president elected and that sort of stuff. So, but in, in, in uh, countries where you, where you have a king, it's actually a marriage between the two. So when he became king, it was his marriage. It was his marriage to, uh, what do you call it? It was his marriage to Israel, okay? Now, the man goes on speaking, and again, this is a separate thing now, a separate song. It says, how beautiful you are, my love, how beautiful you are. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Now, remember the idea of the way they veil them in the Mideast. The, the other thing to notice here is the idea of doves. Now, we talked about the morning doves, which are these, these white doves. The fact is that probably the most serious medical problem in the Mideast historically, it's getting to be less now. I still see it a lot in Arab countries, but it isn't a big deal in Israel, uh, is blindness. And one of the reasons why blindness is such a big problem is they have all these animals defecating on the streets and everything. And then as people walk and the animals walk, that's all rendered dust. And they have all this blown up in the air because everything's so dry. But it reached a point at one time that almost the sign you had been on the Hajj, you know, to Mecca was that you were blind because so many people end up. But if you go into the Mideast, I'll, I'll use Egypt as the example. When you're in that area, you almost no, see no one with correct eyes. You see one with one eye going off one way or one eye with sores. You, you very seldom see anyone who has two eyes where they're the color and then the white on the outside. It is very rare. And so he comments particularly on her eyes. He says, your hair is like a flock of goats frisking down from Mount Gilead. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen goats come down a mountain, but they flow like water through the thing, okay? Although um, I think today to compare a woman's hair to a flock of goats wouldn't go over big, but okay. you might want to try it, okay? He says, your teeth are a flock of shorn sheep coming up from the washing, and each one has its twin. So the idea that all the teeth meet, you know, and, and they're white, this sort of thing. Not one unpaired with another. You aren't missing any teeth. Your lips are like a scarlet thread and your words enchanting. Interestingly enough, this thing of scarlet th thread, I think it's, it's funny that in our society, um, really large lips are seen as beautiful. And the verse is true at that time in that society. So the idea that her, her lips are like a scarlet thread. Okay, why don't we, uh, we stop this here and uh, pick it up with four. Uh, it's actually, it's chapter four, but the verse is, uh, is it chapter? Yeah, it's chapter four and the verse is three, B. It's the second half of verse 3, but we'll pick that up when we come back.
Any questions?